Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is going to be a spotlight session. We've got three very different um, but very interesting looking talks for you today. Um, in between each of the spotlight talks, there's going to be a Q&A, so make sure to submit your questions to Slido. We've been finding there's a little bit of a delay with Slido, so um, please send your questions as quickly as possible, um, either during the talks or immediately when we go to Q&A, otherwise we might miss them. Um, so do make sure you, you type them in nice and fast so that we can get to them. Um, without further ado, let's get Get to our first speaker for today is Dr. Millie Zametta. She is the head of public policy at the Open Data Institute, and she is going to be talking to us today about decolonizing the data. Millie, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gemma. Um, yep. So I'll be looking at um, what we can learn from ancient Greek tragedy um, and apply to modern technology, digital technologies, and data. Um, so a brief outline of my talk. First, I'll be looking at the fragility of goodness, um, and then data as infrastructure. And then the questions I'll be asking are infrastructure for whom, um, infrastructure for what, and finally considering the fragility of power. So my starting point is um, the work by Martha Nussbaum, the classicist and philosopher on fragility of goodness. And her, she explores the ancient Greek idea that your status as a good person is fragile because a change in your circumstances can put you in a situation where you are the villain. And this is the essence of ancient Greek tragedy. Um, Aristotle calls it peripateia, the dramatic reversal of fortune. Um, and in Aeschylus' um, tragedies, he, he has this wonderful phrase, um, by suffering we learn, which in ancient Greek is mathetes pathetes. And I thought this audience would like the reference to the early reference to mathematics there, which is about learning, right? So you learn by suffering. Um, and the question that Martha Nussbaum asks is, but what do you learn? And so in this presentation, what I intend to do is use um, philosophy of literature um, as a kind of critical lens to examine philosophy of data, to think about how we, how we think about data. And I'm going to use a particular kind of reversal, which is uh, decolonization as a significant reversal of our circumstances. So let's think about data as infrastructure. At the Open Data Institute, we consider data to be a kind of critical national infrastructure similar to roads. So it's infrastructure that underpins policy and operations, it's across sectors, but it's also a public good that makes other products and services and goods possible, including digital technologies like artificial intelligence. So it's important that this kind of critical national infrastructure is robust, um, that it's well designed, that it serves well in all circumstances, including in reversal of fortune. Um, so it must be inclusive and equitable. Um, and we've seen some kind of challenges to this. Um, at the 2019 um, ODI summit, uh, we had a keynote presentation by Caroline Criado Perez um, from her book, Invisible Women, which looked at all the ways in which um, women are excluded from a lot of data, right? So, so the world is not as safe for them as it is for men, um, because for example, safety data is designed for the, the male body, not the female body. Um, in Britain, we have the um, Inclusive Data Task Force just launched um, by the ONS to ensure that the UK's national statistics are inclusive and equitable in that way. Um, and in America, Joe Biden, the new president, has um, launched a couple of executive orders intended to ensure that America's data infrastructure is equitable and inclusive. So, so we know that it's important. But the questions I think that are really critical is infrastructure for whom um, and for what purposes? So let's think about infrastructure for whom. So Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher of language, he has this wonderful phrase, um, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Um, and I think that what he's talking about there is the way that language can shape thought and shape our experience of reality. Um, but data infrastructure is a kind of language, it's a technical language, right? Um, data standards and taxonomies help us to organize data and they create a kind of common language between data sets to make them interoperable um, and determine, determine which of their features are important and how those should be curated for usability. But I think the question we need to ask ourselves is whose language is it? Um, so the Kenyan philosopher and crit lit um, literary critic Nugugi Wathiongo, he talks about the way that kind of um, one of the one of the consequences of colonialism was it, it, it didn't just kind of um, exploit natural resources, it transformed the psychology of those who were colonized because there was now a split between their domestic language, the language that they spoke at home with their families, and their professional or their technical languages, which were the languages they were taught and had to use at work and at school and for their careers, right? So, so you know, you, you could, um, it, it, the language they used for work was not the language that they grew up in and felt most comfortable in. 
Um, so I guess the question I'd like to invite us to consider is, well, who is determining the technical languages? Um, whose priorities do they reflect? Whose value system do they reflect? Um, and whose conceptual scheme? Because language shapes thought. Um, and at the ODI, one of our projects is with um, the Collections Trust, um, curating um, data sets from different cultural institutions across Britain so they can share data about their collections. Um, and in the autumn, um, the CEO of Culture and Dr. Errol Francis, he gave a wonderful presentation um, called Decolonizing the Database. And he talked about how, you know, our, our, the way we categorize cultural artifacts reflects our assumptions about what they're used for. You know, is this, is this a piece of art or is it a household good? That kind of thing, right? And if we have those debates even within, within one culture, imagine what that debate is like when you've got several languages and several cultures at play. So it's really important that our conceptual schemes, how we categorize data, how we decide what the labels are, um, must reflect more than one culture. I think it's also important to think, well, infrastructure for what, for what purposes. So what you can see here is a map of Kazakhstan. And a few years ago, I was lucky enough to travel to Kazakhstan um, on, a, on a scheme funded by the British Council um, as an academic exchange program. Um, and what was striking about, um, about Kazakhstan is, as you can see from that map, that the black lines are all, all the major roads and they all lead north-south. Um, and it's because Kazakhstan used to be, for I think a, a few hundred years, it used to be part of the Russian empire. And under Russia's rule, all roads lead to Moscow. So you have these massive roads going north-south and very few roads going east-west. Um, and this became a challenge for the country once it gained independence from Russia in the 1990s, um, because it would be better for its domestic economy to have more crisscrossing roads and east-west roads. Um, it would also be better for the global economy for trade routes if there was a, a wider variety of roads because of Kazakhstan's strategic location um, in Central Europe. So then we've got fantastic infrastructure, brilliant roads, but they only go in one direction, right? Because they, only, they were only intended to serve one purpose, which was the purpose of colonial Russia. So again, thinking about Wittgenstein and, and the limits of my language as the limits of my world, language doesn't just um, shape thought, it also limits it, it also constrains it. And I think it's, you know, it, you might have, you might build roads very skillfully, but ultimately they might only be going in one direction and you might not realize that. So how do you how do you get that breadth? How do you get that um, I guess the, the the broadness to think east west and not just north south? Um, and in in data science we have this sort of um, idea that the discipline itself is multidisciplinary, right? You've got mathematics, you've got statistics, um, you've got computer science, and you often have domain skills or domain knowledge too. Um, but I think it might be worth us also thinking in terms of the scope of multidisciplinarity to think about uh, different cultural competencies that might be involved. And I know we often talk about diversity and equality um, in the kind of um, the backgrounds of, of the data scientists, but I, I think we might need to go further than that and think about um, diversity and equity in determining the goals of the projects themselves. Um, so that goes back to my earlier point about, you know, infrastructure for whom, as well as infrastructure for what. Um, and um, at, the, at the Open Data Institute, we have this tool called the Skills Framework. Um, I'll just click to it in a moment here. Um, and it's what we consider the kind of basic principles of, of data literacy. Um, and what I think is interesting about it is it doesn't just have quantitative and analytical skills. It also includes um, change management. Um, and I think that's really important because if you're talking about rebalancing power and you're talking about working in a different way and including maybe perspectives that haven't been included before or traditions that haven't been included before, that if that's going to be done in equitable terms, then you're also talking about a rebalance of power, um, which is essentially a change management program. And, um, and so the critical question I, I have today is, well, you know, what are the terms of engagement? And if our data science teams and our data projects haven't incorporated um, change management as one of the core competencies, um, then maybe we're just building roads north south and we're not yet ready for what's involved in terms of investment and changes in ways of working of building building roads that go east-west and that also crisscross. So I'd like to bring this back to my, um, my earlier points about um, the fragility of goodness and thinking about it through the lens of um, ancient Greek tragedy. So by suffering we learn, said Aeschylus, but learn what is the question that Martha Nussbaum asks us to consider. So in political philosophy, we have this idea from John Rawls of um, the Maxi Min principle, 
And they're the ideas that we should try to create a society um, that maximizes the well-being of those at the minimal level, right? So if you're in the, the most minimum position of that, of that society, um, the society has been organized in such a way to maximize your well-being. Um, and the way John Rawls gets to this conclusion is by thinking about, you know, well, if, if you were to design that society before knowing what role you would have in it, then you would be risk averse and try to make sure that just in case you were one of the worst off, you would still be okay. And so that's how he gets to an ideally designed society. So if, I think that if we, if we take that maxim in principle, we start to get a different sense of how we could think about our data infrastructure and then the digital technologies that are built off the back of it. Um, so Ursula Le Guin in her science fiction novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, um, without, without any spoilers, it's, it's considered a feminist classic because it's set in a world um, where, where people, um, they're, they're, they're gender fluid and they're non-binary, so sometimes they're male, um, but sometimes they're female, and, and it, it changes all the time. And as a result, there's no patriarchy in the sense that we know it now, because there isn't that accumulation of power um, over, over decades, over, over centuries, there isn't that kind of patrilineal um, accumulation of capital. And, and as a result, it's a kind of, um, it's a gender equal society because like with the maxim in principle, at any time, anyone could be male or female. And so you, you make sure that both are equitable. Um, so that's, it's, it's a fantastic novel. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. Um, and then an, another, another source that's been influencing my thinking on this is um, from Achille Mbebe, uh, the Cameroonian philosopher. Um, and in his most recent book, The Critique of Black Reason, he has this idea, it's called becoming black of the world. And, and for him, blackness is not an absolute signifier that describes your skin color. It's, it's a signifier of your economic or political or social status or relation, right? And so one way of thinking about it is, you know, maybe in the past there were communities who have functioned as if they were black in some societies. And I think about the history of oppression, say that um, some Irish communities have experienced. So they are the kind of, they have experienced the becoming black of the world. They have been treated as if they are black. Um, and so Bebe considers, well, in the future, you know, people whose skin color is black might occupy a place in society that's actually quite privileged, which means that the, the, the place in society that is much, much more disadvantaged or minimal might then be occupied by people whose skin colour is not black. They would have experienced the becoming black of the world. Um, and that's really interesting to me because it, you know, if, if it's not that your skin colour changes, it's that the significance of it changes. And if, if that were to be the case, then what kind of society would we design under the maximin principle if that kind of reversal, that kind of peripateia, as Aristotle calls it, was possible in relation to, to, to race as well? So thinking back to data infrastructure and our use of digital technologies. So for Martha Nussbaum, um, the fragility of goodness, that, that recognition that the tragic hero is someone who thought they had been good all their life and then found out that actually they weren't. And if their circumstances changed, suddenly they were the villain or suddenly they were someone who needed compassion or pity um, rather than someone who was, you know, looked up to. That, that, that tragic kind of um, peripatia, the essence of tragedy, that the point of it for Martha Nussbaum is that Knowing that the reversal can happen, um, you, you live with humility and compassion. You live with the humility to know that your, your situation as a good person is fragile. And so you, you, the way you relate to others um, is, is more compassionate as a result. And I, I guess my question for you is, well, what if, what if power has the same kind of fragility? If we think of power in those terms as contingent and something that could, could be subject to reversal. So from rules, what kind of data infrastructure would you want or would you need if you were one of the most vulnerable in society and if you applied the maximum principle to yourself? And equally from Le Guin, how would we use data and digital technologies like AI in a world where the roles could be reversed at any time? And I think those are the questions we should be asking ourselves um, and trying to answer. Thank you. Millie, thank you so much. What a fascinating um, talk. I enjoyed that immensely. Um, and thank you for all the recommendations on, on books and people to look at. Um, always a great thing to be taking notes of at these kind of, um, these kind of presentations. We've got a few questions through, um, as I suspected, it was such an interesting talk from the audience. Uh, the first one that's got a couple of upvotes is from Mike Wald. How can AI automatic language translations include minority languages? I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, so should I, should I carry on showing my presentation or should I take it off? Uh, no, you can, it's okay because uh, we're on the screen. It's just you and my face at the moment, okay. so we can't see it. <laughs> so, um, 
I don't know what the la what the answer to that language is, but I think it's important. I think he is understanding that it's important, right? That this should be a, a key question rather than something that's considered as an afterthought or a nice to have. It's giving the weight to that. Um, but it, I think for me, it's not just about um, including those languages, but maybe finding out what people from those communities and those cultures want, and you know, and not assuming that they want more of what you know we want to do. So, what what kind of technology would they like to design, and what would they use it for? Um, so again, it's not just infrastructure for whom, but infrastructure for what. Amazing. Love that. Um, let's go to the next question from Neil Fitzgerald. What's your opinion of the draft national data strategy? Will it help solve the issues regarding data as infrastructure in a fair and transparent way? Um, so um, at the ODI, the Open Data Institute, we responded to the consultation in December and um, I believe DCMS um, uh, uh, you know, will be, will be kind of announcing, announcing their sort of distillation of all the consultation they responded um, within the next couple of months. I think, it's, I think it's heading in the right direction. I like the fact that there was um, significant attention paid to the importance of responsible use, use of data. Um, but I, I guess it's, um, as with anything, it's, I wonder whether we have understood um, the, the scale of the, both the challenge, but also the scale of the opportunity. And one of the things that really, um, so the reason I was in Kazakhstan for that exchange program was because they had those challenges with their physical infrastructure, with their roads, right? They had become um, sort of quite um, pioneering in use in their use of digital government. So because the temperatures vary from, you know, minus 40 degrees centigrade in the winter to 40 degrees centigrade in the summer, <laughs> that's quite, <laughs> so trying to build roads in, that, in those conditions is quite challenging, right? So they had kind of leapfrogged to thinking about digital government and, you know, digital accessibility. So I think I also see this as an opportunity. If, if there are aspects of our infrastructure that are fundamentally flawed, rather than try to just incrementally layer up on them, is there any way we can leapfrog and think about something really bold and really imaginative that we could be doing? Final question for you before we move on to the next talk. This is from Anonymous. Um, in artificial intelligence, utilitarianism is very influential. For instance, with RL, the definition of rational agent. Uh, do you think that these philosophical ideas too should be decolonized? So I, I think that there's, we're starting to see more influence um, from um, philosophical traditions outside of the West. So we're starting to see more recognition of, say, you know, um, more African approaches to ethics, for example, and African, African value systems in the decolonizing AI movement. And, and that makes me really glad. Um, and I think that that will also have um, legitimacy because it will be considered sustainable in different parts of the world. Um, and I, I think that it's, you know, um, I, I like the fact that different moral traditions are now speaking to, to, to different ways of doing AI. Um, and I, I don't know if the, 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 the person asking the questions ever had a chance to, to read um, Afrofuturism sci-fi. And that's, that's, you know, kind of science and technology if it was invented um, by people from other cultures other than Western cultures. And that's, that's quite exciting to think what else could be done with the technology. Amazing, Millie. Thank you so much um, for a fascinating uh, presentation and for answering these questions. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation now. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we've got Professor Mark Plumbley, Professor of Signal Processing at the University of Surrey, who's going to be talking to us about AI for sound. Mark, welcome to the stage. Much. It's great to be here. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about AI for oh, sound. So, sorry, Mark, just uh, interrupting. I don't know if that's just me. Maybe we can get the tech team. In. There's something funny going on with your microphone, I think. So we'll just have a little play around with that for a wee second. How's that? Okay, that's me without the headphones. That is much better, Mark. Off you go. Right, okay, well apologies for the uh, start. Given this is a talk about AI for sound, it's important for us to get the sound right while we, uh, while we do this. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a, a research professor from uh, the University of Surrey um, and I've been working on um, sound recognition for a while. And this is really a very brief story about, uh, about AI for sound and all the sort of issues that come up with data and so on as we do this. Um, and uh, before I forget, uh, there are many people who've uh, contributed to uh, this um, uh, along the years and so I'm not going to read out all the names but just uh, I'm just the front here between lots of hard work that's been going on behind the scenes from Surrey and Salford and elsewhere. So I think the first thing really that I wanted to say about sound is that it's sort of an invisible um, thing in AI. So a lot of work goes on in AI in images, you can see what's going on, Sound, you can't really see that. You have to listen. It takes time to do that. 
but it's really important if I just pick up one of the figures in the centre here that the impact of, of road noise on people um, on sleep um, heart uh, conditions and so on is really important that it's second only to um, uh, let's say uh, uh, air quality conditions in terms of how important this is and it wasn't until the UK Acoustics Network a couple of years ago did a survey that really could see how big the um, acoustics industry is in the UK. So what are we talking about when it comes to AI for sound? We're really talking about a few different types of recognising sound scenes and events. Um, so I do want to classify a scene. Where are we? Are we in a bus? Are we in an office at home? Or what's in that scene? Is there a, a sort of keys jangling sound? Um, is there a hiss or something? And maybe sound events, these are events where something starts and ends at a particular time. Uh, so these are different types of things that really many people will be familiar with equivalent things in recognising in images, but we're just doing this in sound instead. But because we're dealing with machine learning, we need data in order to make this work. If you've been hearing other talks around the, the rest of today, you've been hearing a lot about data, how important it is, the data study groups that go on. And one of the things that I found about 10 years ago, starting to do work in this space is a lot of people I would talk to at conferences, for one thing, they would be in a, an odd session by themselves. There wouldn't be a session about sound recognition, but also they didn't have data that they could share with other people. So it made very difficult for researchers to compare uh, each other. So together with PhD students and researchers at uh, Queen Mary, as I, where I was then, we set out to gather some data of scenes, quiet streets, supermarkets, restaurants and events. So uh, some of the researchers came in over the weekend and um, dropped things on the desk around the printers and recorded these sounds to make sort of office sounds. And we used this to create a data challenge, um, which um, back in 2013 became the detection and classification of acoustic scenes and events data challenge. And really that first data challenge really set off interest in this direction. We had a small bit of interest from here. Here are just a graph showing some of the um, results that we got from a few different teams that uh, were engaged in this, uh, in this data challenge. Um, and um, the boxes actually uh, just uh, are systems that, are, uh, that would be marked as being the same. So we didn't have very, quite enough data to make everything statistically significant. But what we did found, find is that the little red uh, thing up here is what you get from a majority vote. That's if you take all the other systems, um, you vote to see which ones think they are the best, and that gets the best performance better than any, so, which suggests that democracy is a good idea a lot of the time. And this was really matching what human performance. So there are a couple of studies here on how humans could recognize scenes. You might think 80%, that doesn't sound terribly good, but actually it can be quite a challenge to recognize the difference between a, a park and a quiet street when nothing very much is, uh, is going on. So this is really what thought, okay, this is a good idea. What else can we tackle things into? How about smart home type applications as well? What's going on? in a house. Um, and there are privacy implications in this. We can't just go around recording what's going on in somebody's home and make that available as open data set. Now, fortunately, we were able to uh, work with John Barker from Sheffield, who had already recorded sounds from his home as part of background noise for a speech recognition challenge. And we just repurposed the data that he'd already released, the sound data, um, we were able to employ some undergraduate students to come in over an Easter holiday um, and label up some data for us. Um, and they annotated these in four second chunks about male speech, female speech, um, TV, video, all these going on. Um, we did find afterwards that we should have trained our annotators better. They agreed on about nearly half of the chunks and I think we learned quite a lot of things from this process about how to do things in the future. But this did lead us to another data challenge uh, to follow up from here. And we had help from uh, collaborators at Audio Analytic and funding from Innovate UK and ESRC, the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council as part of uh, helping that work. 
And so really this began um, a new research community, which is now known as the DCASE research community, Detection and Classification of Acoustic Scenes and Events. If you want to find out more about this space, there's now an annual workshop. We hosted the workshop ourselves um, in Surrey in 2018. Uh, this year it's going to be a hybrid workshop in Barcelona, um, so, but you can join remotely if, uh, if you want to. And this has really built a community on data. So not, we haven't been the only people doing this. And in fact, really the scale up has come from getting much more data available. And one of the things that, that really gave a big breakthrough here was available large scale data set. Um, so team working at uh, Google replace, um, released a large data set of 2 million uh, 10 second segments uh, of audio based on YouTube videos. So here's a little sound clip as an example. <laughs> so I hope you could hear the sound uh, from, from that, a dog and a duck having a discussion. Um, the, uh, the point about this data set is not only is it a large amount of data, but they also worked to build categories into that to categorize sounds from different human sounds, natural sounds, mechanical sounds, and so on. And altogether, there are something like uh, 500 and something uh, categories now, about 600 categories from here. Now, as an audio researcher, one of the challenging things for, for us from here is that the sound audio is not actually able to be released. So you can access that if you can access the YouTube videos yourself, but that can't be released um, uh, internationally as sound. And so if we do want to use it, we have to rely on data processing um, uh, exceptions to copyright rules because of that. But the, the videos are actually owned by the person who uploads it. They can decide that they want to take that down. So there are issues about how long the data can stay available. Since then, other data sets have been available from, for example, Freesound, where the uploaders do really give uh, permission for people to reuse their data. And so it is something where we have to be concerned about this field. So examples of the sorts of things that, uh, that we can do with these sounds, here are a few examples that we can, can play about um, uh, recognizing uh, this task. It's called weekly labelled because uh, if we knew exactly when things started and stopped that would help but often we just have a tag or a, or a label on the sound that says this is approximately where the sound is. Here's an example of a truck horn and you'll be able to hear that it doesn't actually happen all the time it's just in the middle of the sound. <laughs> So you can hear there that the uh, truck sound was only part way through. There are various other sounds here. This, these are maps that show the time along the bottom and frequencies up the side, which signal processing people like myself are quite used to uh, seeing. But this gives us an idea of the fact that we need to focus on somewhere in the sound to tell us where the important part is. And that actually uh, leads on to some examples of using uh, deep learning methods that I'm sure everybody has been talking about uh, earlier on today, but in particular methods based on attention. And so there are two branches you can see in here. One that says essentially where the important stuff is and the other bit tries to recognize what it is in that section. So um, we've done um, quite well over the years in these uh, types of methods. I won't really go into the detail because it's really just a short presentation here. Um, but um, based on here, one of the things that we've been trying to encourage and many of these fields do encourage people to do is releasing our code so that other people can build on that. And based on that, the community now recognizes these three through reproducible system awards. So not only if you do well in the system, you get a prize, but also if you release your code so that other people can run it. And that really shortcuts things because there's so much that you don't get from a research paper. So the idea of reproducible research is really important in able to being able to build uh, in this space. And a lot of the AI community already do that by releasing code in Python or MATLAB or other languages. Okay, so where we are now is that this type of sound recognition is now becoming uh, commercially available. 
Uh, if you're in the US, uh, you can uh, get Alexa Guard, uh, which listens out for things like glass breaking, smoke alarms going off. Uh, when, you, uh, when you go out, you say, Alexa, I'm leaving. Um, if you had Alexa device, I hope it didn't respond to that. Um, but um, that will set it up so that it will then listen out for these things while you're out. Um, Google Nest Aware has also got a similar uh, critical sounds feature and announcement just the end of last year that uh, the UK company Audio Analytics has paired up with Qualcomm to make chips that go into mobile phones so that your mobile phones will recognize the type of sounds around you and change the settings so that you don't leave it on vibrate when you're in a loud, a loud bar, where once we can get back to those, uh, then it will actually tell you that the phone is ringing rather than just vibrate quietly in your pocket without you noticing. So um, this is now leading to a, a fellowship, which was partly inspired by a, a Turing uh, idea um, into where we go next with AI for sound. And really there are many types of applications where we could go in sounds. Just think of all the things that you listen to when you close your eyes, that what you could do with that. Um, and what we're focusing on in this project is in four particular applications. So one in smart homes, one in smart buildings, uh, one in smart cities, and one in the creative sector. But the key change that we're trying to make is that the previous work in case community that I was talking about is very much based on data. But we want to change over so that it's based on people that we're starting with the users and the stakeholders that want to use this technology. So we're sort of turning our research process around the other way. We want to use participatory engagement right up front so that we get from people what they want from the technology and then we design the technology in order to deliver that. Um, and in fact, there's something on tomorrow I'll mention at the end um, where we'll be doing part of that. An example of these methods, um, the virtual world cafe. So world cafes, this is a way you can bring many people together in a cafe type environment. You spend a half a day talking to people. You have different, uh, different tables with coffee and so on. We, in the current pandemic, have to do this virtually. And we piloted a version of this with uh, academics to start with from diverse backgrounds to get what sort of things would come out here. Uh, we've got a range of things, I'm not going to go through them, but lots of ideas came out that we wouldn't have been able to think of if we were just starting from our own perspective. So things like relating noise pollution, and biodiversity to the sounds that you could make in the environment. Get that. So our next step um, is a virtual world cafe using other users and that's what we're recruiting for for the moment. So really to, to wrap up in the last couple of minutes, uh, there are quite a few challenges to overcome. Many of them have been talked about in other sessions here, privacy, uh, preservation, fairness and accountability. How do we make sure that our data is going to be reflective of uh, the people that are going to be using this technology um, and um, how we actually go about gathering the labels from that because labeling is an expensive process from here. So uh, to conclude a very brief tour, um, we have got examples of machine learning that can recognize sounds, um, but the next step, instead of going on to say, what extra percentage correct can we get? How can we use this technology now to benefit people? So we have to be concerned about privacy and security, computational issues, but how do we actually get this used in to make well-being in the home or in smart cities work? much better with that. And the key to this is designing with users in mind. So I've got just one more slide for additional information. If you want to find out more, um, there's a book. I saw a couple of people waving books around uh, earlier on. This is a more technical one. If you want to find out about computational analysis of sound scenes, have a look at this one. Also tomorrow, um, once you've had the breakfast session at Turing, you can come across the Connected Places catalog for another breakfast session about urban communities with sound sensing and I'll be talking more about sounds uh, there. So I think that's everything from me. Uh, so thanks very much for listening so far and uh, Gemma back to you.
Thank you so much, Mark. That's absolutely fascinating as well. It's a, this is a great session for such different talks and always the best way to um, to be inspired and pushed out of our comfort zone, as um, as we were saying in the intro session. And we've got a couple of questions that have come through for you that we'd love to, to put to you just now. Um, the first one's from Mike Wald. Um, Hearing impaired people need automatic sound recognition for automatic captioning. Have you done research in this also? Um, so it is something that our group is interested in. Um, so I haven't done that much research um, um, myself, um, but uh, we are trying to work with the BBC on audio captioning. So how we can get information of, from the sounds that are happening um, in maybe a TV programme so that we can then recognise those sounds and describe those, those sounds in an audio description way. So um, yes, there are um, uh, quite advanced technologies now for speech recognition. Um, and so Zoom, the platform that I'm using to present on has quite good um, uh, captioning the works most of the time. We want to be able to expand that to recognize other types of sounds as well. So that you could get that sense of, oh, there was a door knock or a car revving, and that will also come across and be described too. Oops, sorry, my screen's jumping around there trying to unmute myself. Um, we've got another question that's come through uh, Slido as well for you um, just now from Jez and Sibyl. Um, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing names here. Um, apologies to all those in the audience. Um, what kind of future applications are there for recognising sounds? Oh, where, where do I stop? Um, so uh, some of them could be, um, uh, for COVID, for example, um, recognising cops. So there's an interesting uh, project uh, in Cambridge um, on cough recognition for uh, detecting the onset of coronavirus, or even just the changes in your voice. So it might be you, just the way that you speak might change a little bit. Um, so I think that, so that's one of the really interesting applications in, in other sorts of medical applications. So uh, lung sounds, heart sounds, the sorts of things that might be less invasive than other technologies. If you go along to, to, to your GP, often the first thing they'll do is, is listen to their heart, your heart, listen to your lungs. What sort of things could, could do to, to help that? And also for training of, of things there as well. So I think there are, there are a lot of things that we could do. Uh, and actually it's what makes it really interesting in this space that there's so many applications from um, uh, say condition monitoring for cars. Is your car not quite working right? Can you hear something? You know, one of the bearings is rattling or the engine is not quite firing properly. All of those things that you could, uh, you could imagine hearing, if we can build machines to recognize those uh, instead, can we help people that are not as skilled at doing that to, to have the benefit of that experience? Amazing. What you were saying there about the, the health applications reminds me of one of the earlier presentations today all about gait analysis and, and using uh, AI for being able to analyse all of the, um, the movement uh, data that's coming from a sensor on the back. Of course, you're starting thinking about what's coming out the, the, the voice box too is really interesting. Uh, let's do one final question before we move on to our final speaker of today's from Nick. Can the same techniques be used in ultrasound uses? Has it been tried? Oh, that's, that's interesting. I don't know that, but I would have thought the similar approaches could be used. Um, it's, if I come back to the community aspect that I talked about, often researchers in different areas will go to different conferences and will not meet people in other fields. So I wouldn't tend to meet the people in ultrasound uh, because they'd be at different international conferences, just as I wouldn't meet the people in underwater acoustics, for example, because they're also a different set of conferences. So I think that's one of the things that I hope that the Alan Turing Institute can help to bring together because we're based in the UK and we can cut across many of these things and bring together people with the shared techniques that otherwise uh, we wouldn't meet as international researchers when we're going off to these other more specialist sessions. And indeed, of course, that is the point of these kind of conferences too, where we have so many different kinds of sessions and this session itself, where we've got different topics too, hopefully getting some intersections there and hopefully inspiring some of that interdisciplinary thought um, right there, depending on what you're all talking about. Um, Mark, thank you so much for, I'm sorry for, there's a few other questions that came through, apologies, we're not going to have time 
uh, to, to do them, though I'm sure you can um, get in touch with the researchers directly if you have any specific questions about their work. Um, we're hopefully going to move on to our third third speaker. I know, David, we've been having a few issues with your mic, so let's, let's see if we can hear you loud and clear before you come on. I'll do your introduction first. We've got, as our final speaker, hopefully, Professor David Barber, who's a Turing Fellow and Director of the UCL Centre for Artificial Intelligence, and he's hopefully going to be speaking to us about AI co-workers. Um, David, can we hear you? I hope so. Can you hear me, Jenna? Yes, we can. Oh, How great. exciting. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> well, then the stage awesome. is yours. Off you go. Great. Thanks, folks. So, yeah, I don't spend too long. Just to give you a little um, sort of flavour for uh, an idea, which is not a, really a new idea, but I think it's quite a cool idea. And uh, I think it has a lot of relevance for uh, machine learning today. So, if you think about um, the following problem, let's imagine you want to build an, a cat flap. Okay, a smart cat flap. And the idea is that this cat flap is going to, you know, when your cat comes home with something in its mouth, some prey in its mouth, uh, you would like the cat flap to, to close. Uh, when the cat comes home without anything in its mouth, no prey, uh, you want the cat flap to open. So, you know, you want to prevent the, the, the cat coming in with prey. So, you know, this is an interesting little uh, project. And there's a guy called Ben who, uh, attempted to do this, and what he did was he, um, you know, he built a cat flap uh, here. And he had uh, some kind of Arduino, uh, some electronic system, and the cat comes up the the ramp here with something in its mouth. There's a camera that looks at the cat, and then if it thinks there's something in its mouth, it will uh, lock the door, and the cat can't come in. So um, the interesting thing about this for me is that actually there's a lot of you know useful technologies here. So you can actually put a lot of processing now fabric on the camera, the camera can look at the ramp, and you can also program this uh, camera uh, to talk to the Arduino, to then shut the door. So the the most difficult part about this is not actually, it turns out, the, the electronics or the, you know, the, the control of the, the electronics of, of the door, but actually the recognition, the machine learning of whether or not the, the cat has got prey in its mouth. That's the most difficult thing. So how, how can you do that? How can you, when the cat's got something in its mouth, uh, lock the door? So what Ben did is he monitored his cat over uh, some weeks and months, and he got about 20,000 images of uh, his cat. Sometimes there was no cat actually on the ramp, sometimes the cat had something in its mouth, sometimes it didn't have something in its mouth. And Ben labeled every single one of these 20,000 images by hand. So this is a kind of a, a cool thing to do. Uh, and then he uh, you know, took him some time to do that, some weeks to do this labeling effort. But once he's got these labeled examples, uh, cat, no cat, or cat uh, with bird in mouth, etc., he can then train an AI system to recognize whether or not the cat's got prey in his mouth. So he took a fairly standard off-the-shelf uh, classifier with an input image and some uh, deep neural network output, you know, with cat called prey in his mouth, yes or no, for example. Um, and then he uses those 20,000 odd labeled images to train this network. So the cool thing is that there's a lot of open source tools out there that will help you to do this automatically. Ben himself is not an AI expert. He's not the, uh, you know, familiar with this stuff, but even a relatively a lay person like himself, the tooling has now reached that stage where you can actually do this without being an expert. You can train, for example, a deep neural network this way to, to do quite uh, interesting things, such as building an AI Kepler. So when uh, Ben has done this, he uh, tested it for a month or so, and he found that actually the, pat the uh, cat was correctly brought in, let into the house uh, most of the time. Uh, just one time he was unfairly locked out when in fact it didn't have anything in his mouth. And of the five times that it tried to enter with some prey in his mouth, it actually was blocked, so it incorrectly didn't block it once uh, out of five times. But that's a pretty pretty good result, and it's quite you know, an, an interesting uh, sort of state that we're at in AI that you can do this kind of thing. So what's wrong with this? This is, you know, uh, in some sense a very cool thing, but there are many things that, in my opinion, are, are not quite right about this. So you need a lot of labeled data to train an AI system. So Ben, you know, he, the vast majority of his time and effort was actually in just labeling the data. It took him weeks just to label those 20,000 images. 
And okay, for, for Ben, it's relatively straightforward. He actually knows what he's doing. In fact, he could even outsource that in principle to get people to label for him an image as to whether it has a, a mouse in the, uh, a, a, as a prey in the, in the cat's mouth or not. Um, but there are certain situations where you would not be able to do that, where the data is very sensitive, and you would not wish other people to be involved in labeling your data. And similarly, there are situations where only experts can label your data. So if you're thinking, for example, about uh, medical uh, images, only trained radiologists could label uh, your, your, your medical scans. So um, actually getting the labeled data is now, in some sense, the real bottleneck in machine learning. It's not the necessarily the tooling of the machine learning uh, sort of uh, hardware or necessarily the, the software, but it's actually how on earth do you get these, these labels. And another thing which is kind of disappointing in some sense is that humans are only asked to provide very simple kinds of labels. You know, is this a, you know, a cat or is a cat got a prey in its mouth? Yes or no. It's a very simplistic approach. But on the other hand, humans typically have a much richer understanding of the problem than that. They'll have some clues about what kinds of things to look for. For example, you know, you perhaps ought to be focusing on the mouth area for the cat. Uh, you know, this sort of uh, prey looks smaller than the cat, etc. So there are certain kinds of knowledge that we automatically will have, which are much richer than the kind of binary yes, no labeling that people typically are asked to provide. So um, another problem is that these systems are also very clunky. Once you've trained the system, you spent all this time doing the data labeling, the systems typically are, are fixed. You buy this system from some software company. You will deploy it, but that's it. You know they don't. The systems don't update. They're not responsive to changes uh, in the environment. For example, if the data situation is changing, then the systems don't retrain automatically. They don't necessarily even recognize that they need to be trained, and also they don't give any sense typically of, of their confidence. So if you Thinking about it, you know, if you really want to to work well with a, with a human uh, uh, coworker, you need to get some kind of sense of how confident they are in their predictions and what they're telling you. And if we don't have that, then this is not a very useful uh, coworker. And in a similar way, we don't have a good understanding of the confidence in these predictions from an AI system. It's also not that useful. So. I think finally, another thing to say is that there's a lot of fear out there that you know, rather than, you know, the AI is sort of taking over, right? It's replacing jobs rather than being there to help us. The one way forward is to use uncertainty much better. So knowing what you know or don't know is very valuable and, and knowing how confident you are in that knowledge is very valuable. And similarly, you know, an overconfident uh, colleague who is always very, sure about what they're telling you, but in fact, sometimes wrong, you'll very quickly learn to, to distrust or not to trust that, that colleague. And also, it's not necessarily bad that somebody tells you they don't know the answer because that, or they're not sure about what to do in the situation, because that gives you an opportunity to learn more about the, the situation. So active learning is a paradigm which has been around for a long time, but can help you to solve some of the kinds of uh, challenges that Ben was, was doing. So instead of Ben labeling upfront 20,000 images, what he could have done is he could have labeled a few images and then presented these to the machine learning system. The system would train on those few images. And then for images that the system has already seen, it will say, uh -huh, I'm pretty confident about what's happening here. That's a cat with the uh, with mouse in its mouth. However, this image here, maybe it's got a, a bird in the mouth, it's never seen anything like that before, and it's not very confident in its prediction, and therefore it asks the human to label that image. So of all of the 20,000 odd images which have not yet been labeled, the machine will look through them and make predictions in each of those images. And for those images where the machine is not confident at all in its prediction, it will ask the human to label those images. The human then relabels its images and the system retrains and this uh, process repeats. And then the remaining images which, for which the machine is still not confident are then uh, given to the human for further labeling and et cetera. And through this process, the system learns to very quickly understand uh, something about the data set and can train very rapidly. So if you look at a, a classical image recognition problem, here are the 10 classes you're trying to say, what these, say an image like the zero, is that a zero, is this a one, et cetera. Uh, there are 60,000 training images. 
And what I'm presenting here on the x-axis is the number of data points which have been labeled uh, by a human. And on the right is the accuracy and the prediction error. And what uh, I just want you to get from this is that we can get almost uh, the same accuracy as using the 60,000 training examples, uh, only having labeled a few hundred of them. So by doing this active learning process where we can ask a human to label the examples which she's not confident, we can actually get away with labeling only a small fraction of the data that would otherwise be needed in a more traditional paradigm of labeling all of the data up front, like Ben did. So Ben actually might have been able to only label by hand maybe just a few hundred images rather than 20,000, he could have done that maybe in an hour or two, rather than uh, a month or so. So similarly, another uh, thing which is very interesting to me is the idea of weak learning. And this is the idea of providing, uh, humans providing more rich information to the machine about uh, their understanding of a problem. So for example, if you're thinking about classifying documents, you might say, uh, you know, uh, if somebody writes in a movie review that uh, you know, this is an awesome movie, then you might say that's a positive sentiment about a movie. Similarly, there, there are other kinds of hints that humans might have about text that would put, help provide the machine some guess or some knowledge about what's actually going on with that text. If it's spam tagging, if you see the word cash in the, in the email, that also might be a hint that this is a spam email. So this is not necessarily providing just yes or no answer, spam no ha or ham or uh, good movie, bad movie review, but actually much richer information. And there are many ways to make use of this information to actually then try to learn uh, with a relatively small number of examples which are labeled, but actually using these kinds of intuitions from the human to build them in to the prediction machine. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can imagine there are uh, a variety of ways to try to do this. So I just want to, to say that there are uh, a couple of companies that I've been involved with uh, that are, are doing well in the UK space. Uh, who are using these kinds of paradigms. So one is reinfer, and they take uh, zero code solutions uh, to training and deploying these AI systems, particularly in the text domain, onto communications data. So in a very small amount of time, you can actually then build from scratch a uh, automatic machine which will look at your emails or your customer feedback data and be able to automatically respond to these customer queries. And these are currently used by uh, typically banks, insurers, e-commerce, and telecommunications giants. And this has been a very successful spin out from, from UCL, but it's really using this, uh, this new, uh, this paradigm of active learning to really rapidly train the system. And more recently, we have another spin out from UCL, which is actually called Human Loop, which also uses a similar kind of uh, active learning approach, but it builds a more uh, general platform for uh, not necessarily just enterprise users, but for any users who come along and you can train then uh, a machine learning system using active learning and related approaches using only a very small amount of labeled data. So um, I just want to uh, finish with, with telling you that in some sense, therefore, this uh, AI sort of active learning approach is if you like a new kind of paradigm uh, to help train these machines much more quickly and in a much richer way to take advantage of people's intuitions about the, the domain. And uh, these are certainly uh, becoming increasingly popular and I think these are likely to actually replace most of the tra traditional classical paradigms of people buying machine learning systems from uh, issuers, for example, IBM Watson, and then being static and never being updated. These systems enable you to rapidly update continually monitor your system, give you feedback on their confidence, and help you to get the best out of the interaction between humans and machines. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and I'm very glad your, uh, your microphone managed to hold up for, for all of your talk. It was great to be able to hear from you as our, as our final um, session, our final talk for this session. Uh, for today, we've got our first uh, questions through from the, from the slide. We've got a couple of minutes for questions, so if anybody else wants to send one over, please do now so that I can see it in time. Um, this one is from Mike Wald. How do deep learning neural networks provide confidence levels? Well, the output of the neural network can be a probability value itself. So the neural network might say, I have a, you know, the probability that this is a, is a cat is 0 
and that in itself could be considered a, a certain a certain kind of confidence. So typically people will threshold them. They might say, well, if the probability is above a certain value, for example, 0.5, then we'll say it's a cat. But clearly in situations where it's very close to 0.5, you might say, mm, you know, this is maybe, maybe we shouldn't be too confident about saying it's a cat. So there are certainly you know, many situations where you, you can imagine that's useful uh, if they're in medical diagnosis systems, that's clearly uh, such a situation. Um, obviously in finance, that's a, that's a huge area where you know, predictions need to take your confidence into consideration. But that's the simplest way to do it for the deep learning system, just to be uh, the deep learning model outputs itself a probability. Thank you very much, David. I mean, we've not had any uh, more through on the slide, but I'm going to sneak in uh, one final question before we wrap up. And it's really just, um, to, you know, oh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that because someone has snuck one in and they get priority over me. Um, this is from Karen Ria. Is this a uh, subsection spe speciality useful to avoid facial recognition problems currently pervading the AI world? To avoid facial recognition problems? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um... So I can say it again if that's helpful. Um, yeah. Basically, Karen is asking, is this subsection specialty useful to avoid the facial recognition problems that are currently pervading the AI world? If it's not quite making sense, I can move on to another one because I'm afraid that's all the information I have. <laughs> um, well, this, this um, it doesn't avoid it in the sense that people are still providing labels. I don't know if that's the question, but humans are still ultimately telling you uh, information about, say, face images, if, if that were, were to be the, the domain. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily remove that as a, if that's the issue. Um, what this is really about is, it's uh, one of these things it's really about is reducing the amount of human effort required to train a machine learning system or an AI system. So typically these systems are trained on the basis of humans labeling uh, images, for example, in your case, it might be face images, um, but they may, you know, typically have to outsource that uh, and ask people to provide uh, labeled images, you know, hundreds of thousands of labeled images of faces. But actually, here you you still have to provide labels, but the number of labels that you provide uh, hopefully will be be much less. But it doesn't avoid the, if you think the you know the ethical issues, if you like, uh, that around say uh, providing labeling at all. <laughs> 